for a crap sender. Hello and welcome. Uh, today I'm going to be dropping a movie review on your ass. Uh, took a bit of a break from uh, actually reviewing, you know, full movies. The uh, movie I'm going to be looking at today is called Torture Garden. Uh, Torture Garden is the second in the series of uh, horror anthology movies by Amicus Productions. It was made in 1967. And um, this one stars Burgess Meredith, Jack Palance, Peter Cushing and some others. So in this particular portmanteau, uh, it is about a group of people who visit a like a, a fairground sideshow exhibit. Uh, the exhibits are varying devices of torture and execution throughout the ages. Um, and it's uh, hosted by some guy that calls himself Dr. Diablo, played by Burgess Meredith. Um, and after the uh, the main show itself is concluded, he uh, he ha he asks people if they would like to see a special exhibit. He's got you know back behind the curtain, and so four people uh, say yes, they'd like to. So he takes them back and shows them a statue of the some uh, goddess of fate, uh, a a tr a tropus. Well, yeah, it's called a tropus for now. Uh, and she's rocking the pair of shears and some strands of thread. And these shears are apparently the shears of fate. And whoever looks into them closely will see there a possible fate, one possible fate that they could befall, could befall them. Um, and so that is like the, you know that's the wraparound story. And so the first tale begins. Uh, with uh, a guy played by Michael Bryant, Bryant, sorry, um, he looks into the shears, and that kind of goes into a trance, and then he like you know starts having a vision, and that's where the first story begins. So the first story is about a, well, it's about a, a guy who is a bit of a bit of a bit of a, I'm not sure, a bit of a gad about, a bit of a ponce. Uh, but he goes to visit his uncle. Um, it's kind of implied he may have been in jail for the last two or three years. Uh, and his uncle's very sick. His, his uncle's dying. And he, his uncle asks uh, said dude to uh, you know mend his way, settle down, get a job, all that bullshit. And um, the guy says, yeah, I will. I just need to, I just have a couple of debts I need to pay off. Um, then he starts grilling the dying uncle for, for you know, his inheritance, his, his, his uncle's fortune. His uncle denies having money, but uh, this guy says it's heard about town that he pays for stuff in cash, and not just normal cash, but gold coins. So he's, you know, he's asking him to where they are, as to where the gold coins are. Um, and his uncle, his dying uncle, starts having a, you know, a bit of a, uh, bit of a turn. Uh, so I'll call him Michael Bryant. What's the character's fucking name? I don't know, I can't remember. Fuck. Colin, yeah. So the dude's called Colin, the uh, the, the, the cat, the, the asshole. So uh, Colin's uh, withholds his uncle's medicine, saying, and not trying, you know, trying to get to tell him where he's uh, got his money stashed. Um, then uh, his uncle uh, his keels over and dies because he you know, didn't get his medication in time. Um, so after that, uh, the doctors and the morgue, the ambulance men, take the body of the uncle away and Colin ends up staying in the house that night uh, and he's looking all over the house for the uncle's money and he can't find it. Uh, so he eventually goes down to the cellar and he spots a shovel and the cellar's like, you know, dirt floor, it's not solid so he starts digging and he comes across uh, a coffin and um, well, it was said. It was mentioned before. I should say that uh, the old uh, the house is on his uncle's house. Uh, used to belong to what was rumored to be a witch. Um, so this coffin that Colin digs up, he uh, pries it open, and uh, there's this black cat and a skeleton in there. The black cat jumps out and pisses off somewhere, and 
Colin's a bit wigged out by this, so he, you know, he, he just buries the coffin again. Uh, then he's like having a kip on the sofa, and he's awoken by the black cat. Uh, the black cat then proceeds to um, telepathically communicate with Colin and tells him that uh, his, his name is Balthazar, uh, and he used to um, serve his uncle, uh, and he'll, he'll also serve him, but he needs to be fed. And I'm not just talking about a couple of tins of whiskers here now. This cat, um, well, we'll get to what this cat likes to eat. Uh, this cat kind of gets inside this like Colin fella's head, possesses him to a degree, um, and he's saying, I'm hungry, I must be fed. Um, well, to cut a long story short, this, this cat it, it eats heads. Don't show it on the screen, but this cat munches on people's fucking heads. Um, so he gets his Colin fella to uh, kill this uh, homeless dude who happens to be sleeping in the, in the, in the shed. This Colin is struggling with the with the cat <laughs> over you know it being you know over his own mind, and then the next morning, the uh, this old lady who I believe was his late uncle's nurse, uh, she comes round, and the cat makes Colin kill her too, and after she's discovered fucking the, the homeless dude's body in the shed, uh, she comes in screaming. Um, Colin clocks her with a shovel and presumably she gets fed to the cat as well or her head does later in that day and Colin's uh, putting like the bodies trying to put the bodies into the boot of his car and a uh, you know, local uh, bobby policeman comes along and, you know, says oh how are you doing I'll give you a hand with that and notices that there's blood coming out of one of the uh, you know Packages, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> so old Colin ends up in fucking in clink, and uh, here's where he tells the uh, some fucking dude about Balthazar, and it wasn't him that did it; it was the cat. Um, this cat uh, shits gold coins as well, and it, that's how it kind of got him to kill people. Um, so he tells him this story, and obviously they think he's he's, he's fucking you know he's, he's nutty. Um, so they leave him in his cell and he's saying, no, let me out if the cat's not fed, it's going to come for me. Um, and it does, you know, off camera this, you know, the cop is right in, the, in his office doing whatever the fuck. And he hears screaming coming from the cell, so he runs to the cell and uh, old Colin's on there with his head missing. A bit of blood. Um, I don't know how this cat fucking eats a head in, in one bite. You know, cause, uh, you have to use your imagination for that, I guess. Um, so anyway... This uh, this story wraps up with the cat reappearing in the police station, and the uh, Bobby on duty. Uh, it starts to possess him, so it's going to like you know obviously it's going to repeat over again, and Bobby's going to end up killing people, and the cat will shit him some gold coins. And so with it, then we go back to the uh, framework story, back in Doctor Diablo's torture garden, and. Uh, Colin starts out of his trance, after looking in the shears, and the rest are saying, you okay? You seem to be in a trance for a minute, so it's like a minute, it seems like days. Uh, and so, you know. And so the next person uh, rocks up, and this person is a uh, woman, um, played by Beverly Adams. What's her name? Was it? Carla Hayes, this woman's called, played by Beverly Adams. Her tale begins... Um, She's she lives in Hollywood. She's from Hollywood. She's an aspiring actress, celebrity, socialite, you know all that bullshit. And um, she shares a, uh, an, an, an apartment with her, an, another woman. But this other girl, she's uh, arranged to have a date with this uh, big shot fucking dude in the movies. And Carla uh, uh, shafts a mate by burning a dress. Um, so she can't go out, so she takes a place on this date with this big wig, um, and they end up going to this, this like restaurant. Uh, it's uh, frequented by you know the glitterati, and there she meets this this actor she she adores. It's like you know it's one of the top ten film f film fucking stars, and she's been knocking it, and, and she's adored him ever since she was like a girl, 
and uh, <clears throat> he's been going around. He's got. He's been going for like thirty years, but you know he doesn't seem to have aged any. Um, and so she ends up landing an audition in this film that he's doing. Well, the, fur the further along their relationship goes, she starts to uh, become suspicious of her. You know, he, he never eats, and then it gets to this moment where this actor dude. I can't remember his fucking name, it don't matter. This actor dude, she sees him go off with a couple of uh, mafia goons, because he has gambling debts or some shit, and uh, they end up shooting him in the head. And uh, Carla and this other dude find his body, and this this dude says, all right, it's okay, come on. We, we've got to take him to the, uh, the, 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 the sanatorium, the sanitarium, sanatorium. We've got to take him to the hospital, special hospital. This, this doctor fucking, Dr. Helm, Dr. He no, no, Dr. Heim, sorry, uh, is introduced. This is like creepy European kind of. Oh, he's alive. We, 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 we fixed him. <laughs> you know, we, we, he'll be back on set on Monday. And he is. And she's like, what the fuck's going on? He had a bullet in his head. And so she starts pressing him about this when she's next season. She starts telling him she's in love with him and he says, no, you can't love me. And she's like, why not? And she tries to, you know, touch his, caress, caress his face. He's like, no, get off. And uh, her nails tear his flesh. And it's revealed that it's metal underneath. And he then proceeds to tell her that uh, this Dr. Heim character is able to... Uh, Take the brain, keep it alive and functioning. Take a functioning brain and put it into like a synthetic body, like a, like, I don't know, like a robotic or automaton type of body, and that's how he's managed to, re you know, keep remain young, looking and keep his, uh, keep his place in the top ten film stars. It, it, you can live, you can be young forever, but it's only for a certain type. It's for those who have a hunger, not for, was it not for food, or drink, or love. You can't have any of those things. But for those who just want to, I don't know, stay, be a you know, <clears throat> stay, stay on top of the, you know, Hollywood list. And so Dr. Hyman is some dude who's also in on the uh, the cult of the synthetic brain people, synthetic brain machines. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> they come in and say, "Oh, we we have to get rid of her." Well, uh, the actor dude says, uh, "No, there's another way." And um, this story ends with uh, them uh, doing to. Carla Hayes, uh, you know, taking her and put her brain and putting it into like a synthetic body, <clears throat> and it, this one ends with her. Uh, she's on. She's she's a film star now with the rest of them, and it's it's got uh, some of her fans going. Oh look, there's Carla Hayes. She's such a living doll, and then it just uh, the, the 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 story ends with just a you know with just a shot of her face. It's just like. And um, yeah, and then we're back to the tent, back to the torture garden, uh, the threads of time, de destiny, whatever the fuck, fate. She is a fate snip again, and she's like, snaps out. He's like, fucking hell. Ta da! Hello. Um, whilst I was in the midst of uh, filming the torture garden review, uh, my um, memory card became full somehow and it uh, closed and stopped recording and so I've got to re-record part of it. This one involves a young woman uh, again looks into the shears of fate and her vision is she's all her story is she's uh, I'm not sure if she's like a student of music or, or, or a journalist but she's uh, into she goes to interview this famous pianist who's a bit of a recluse uh, talks to his piano, he's a bit odd, um, and they end up falling for one another, but um, this dude's piano, which it kind of suggests is possessed by the spirit of his dead mother, um, this piano 
becomes jealous, I guess you could say. And it, this, uh, not a great deal happens. I mean, the relationship goes on a bit, and we get we get little um, <clears throat> bits with the piano where it'll 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 play by itself, or it'll the the uh, lid will come down on the keys by itself, um, indicating that it's somehow alive. Um, but this story like, is very basic, and it ends with the piano pushing the woman uh, out of the window, which is a bit goofy. Um, this isn't, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not particularly scary or anything. It's a bit kind of, I mean, it's got elements, you know, there. Um, but yeah, what's it? This piano is he calls the Euterpe or some shit. Um, but it's a kind of ambiguous ending for this story. That fucking dog. I'll put my foot up his ass before the day is over. Um, yeah, it's a kind of ambiguous ending because uh, the piano, you know, it like it forces this chick out the window and she falls to a death. And then it sh it shows like you know crowd gathering around. Then the the story ends um, where you're back in the room with the piano and um, the dude is playing it. Um, and he's looking at his uh, portrait of his mother, who was, you know, by all accounts was very jealous and possessive of him. Hence the piano is. Um, so it's kind of ambiguous in a sense that did he like in his all his loopiness, you know, his his, his mummy issues? Did he like push her out the window? The, you know, his his uh, lady friend. And was it just uh, you know? Showing it at the, the piano, uh, uh, forcing it out. Was that just kind of a artistic license for basically showing there's no difference between the, the guy and the piano? They are one. That could be a way of looking at it. Um, but anyway, yeah, that story ends. You know, this this chick's she's dead on the pavement outside, uh, and the shears snip the thread, and we're back in the room, and uh, she's like, oh. Fucking hell, like the rest of them. And then we get our final story. And this one features uh, Jack Palance. And he looks into the shears, and his vision begins. And his story is he's a, an avid collector of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, you know, the works, memorabilia, what's like. He's, he's, he, he loves, he's fascinated by the man, he's obsessed by the man. And um, there's this like, expo. Um, of the greatest collection of Poe works uh, by uh, this guy, you know, who owns just he's got the most comprehensive collection of Poe memorabilia and such in the world, apparently. Uh, and this guy's played by Peter Cushing, and so Jack Palance is, is, is you know, he's, he's, all, he's, he's all like eager, he's like, Oh, could you sell me some of this stuff? And Peter Cushing's now, nah, now, nah. but Peter Cushing does invite him to. Uh, have a look at uh, the rest of his collection at his own house. So Jack Palance takes him up on the offer and goes there and uh, him and Peter Cushing share a few drinks and uh, Peter Cushing gets half pissed and decides to show Jack Palance uh, stuff he's got in the cellar or in the basement. Um, so they go down there and Peter Cushing shows him uh, some unpublished written works by Poe. Um, Jack Palance is, uh, well, I've, I've read everything about Poe and I've never heard of any unpublished works. Hmm. Then Jack Palance notices on these unpublished works the, uh, the watermark on the paper says 1966. Uh, so at which point he, he assumes Peter Cushing's forged them himself and he's full of shit, which he would. But, uh, but no, in the basement there's also a door that's locked. Um, Peter Cushing won't let Jack Palance in there to see what's in there. Um, so they have a bit of a scuffle over the keys that Peter Cushing has. And Jack Palance ends up clocking Peter Cushing with a candlestick. Kills the cunt. And Peter Cushing had previously told Jack Palance that his, uh, his grandfather was uh, well a grave robber. And one of the graves he had robbed was that of Edgar Allan Poe. And, it also, and he was also an occultist. So, and he discovered how to uh, bring back the dead. Ergo, he'd, he'd found out how to resurrect the corpse of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and so this room that Jack Palance enters, this secret room, 
um, has Edgar Allan Poe in there, sat there, alive. Well, you know, in undead uh, purgatory, I guess you could call it. Um, and Edgar Allan Poe proceeds to tell Jack Palance that he'd made a deal with the devil for immortality, but um, he prays to die because um, he's, he's trapped in this, this dimension. And um, he tells Jack Palance that he can only be freed from it by someone taking his place in the dimension, or, and then he says, oh, by fire. So Jack Palance says, oh, okay, and blobs a candle into the room instead sets ablaze. Um, then Edgar Allan Poe lowers the boom and says, oh, well, Jack Palance agrees to uh, torch Poe, you know, free him, I guess, in exchange for um, the ending to the story or some of his works. And so Poe says, well, the en ending of this story is, I didn't tell you the whole uh, curse. Uh, the rest of the curse says I can only be freed if someone takes my my place in this dimension, and that person is the one who uh, kills me, or something like that. So it's basically Jack Palance has uh, poked himself in the mustard uh, by you know setting a blaze to the room. He's basically condemned himself to pose fate. Um, so Jack Palance thinks, oh, fuck this, and tries to make an exit, but then flames engulf all the room and he's trapped in there. Uh, and this story ends with uh, this very uh, ominous laugh by Poe, like, ho, 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 ho. It's like, yeah, I, I fucked you, I tricked you. Uh, so, yeah, um, that's how that story ends. And snip, we're back in the room again. Uh, and at this juncture, there is also a fifth. A customer in there, but he's proper freaked out by now. So he um, he starts having a pop at Doctor Diablo, and he, he stabs him with a pair of the she the shears, grabs him out of what's a, a trumpeter's hand, and um, everyone starts screaming and pisses off out of the tent. But it turns out this fifth customer is just uh, like a like a stooge. Him and Burgess Meredith for in it together just to you know up the scare factor. Um, uh, so after this has occurred, Jack Palance, it turns out, is still there watching, uh, and it seems like Burgess Meredith and Jack Palance know each other, know one another, and Jack Palance begins to laugh and says, "It really is you, isn't it?" And like, like he recognises him. He went there to to see him. And well, then Jack Palance uh, pisses off, and then we get a little closing monologue by Burgess Meredith. Um, I can't remember what, exactly what he's rabbiting on about. But if that's the fourth one, is this the first one? I don't know. Um, but I'll call it that for now. He's talking to the first one. He's got his face turned away from the camera. Uh, and then there's like a little transition edit where he turns back, but uh, uh, he's got. He's got a very, uh, very stereotypical, goofy, pantomime devil look. He's got like horns and a moustache. Surprise, surprise, Bud Smodiff is the devil in this, and he's just showing people their possible fates, um, which is a, which is a common theme in the uh, framework stories of the Amicus Portmanteaus. You know, it's, um, and it's it's been done loads, really, um, and that's where the film ends. But yeah, uh, I found the framework story for this one uh, a lot more involved than uh, later ones that came. I mean, I think it was like the first three Amicus films that kind of really had decent uh, framework stories. You know, were a bit more involved. I mean, the rest were just a, just very linear setups to the uh, you know just the stories within the film. Um, but yeah, Burgess Meredith was very, uh, very good. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm mostly, for, well, pretty much primarily familiar with Burgess Meredith from his role as Mickey Goadmill in the Rocky films. I mean, I'm sure many people are. Great, great malevolent perfor malevolent performance. It amps it up. Um, as for the stories themselves, uh, the first one, uh, I'm. Uh, 
I did like because uh, I'm a big I'm, I'm, I like that kind of story anyway you know I've got the whole uh, kind of occulty super, supernatural witchy crafty type stuff um, and yeah it's fairly it was fairly standard is you know the cat that uh, possesses people gets them to uh, kill people and it shits them some gold and eats the head how the fuck did that cat eat the head how does a cat shit the head out it's kind of irrelevant, really. It's a supernatural cat, so, you know. I mean, it's possessed by Balthazar or Balthazar. Um, but yeah, I did like that story. I've, she's, you know, creepy in that hammy manner that these films are good for. Um, so, and the second story about the, uh, you know, the automat automatous uh, celebrities in Hollywood, you know, the, the brains in the uh, machines. Um, yeah, that was fair enough. It wasn't. I mean, it wasn't particularly scary. I mean, it had, it had a had a decent twist. You know, it's not really something you saw coming. Um, and it's you know the only story in this one that's not supernatural. Um, you know, it's more, more call it. I suppose you could call it sci-fi. It's more biology than science, but you know, biology is a science. So yeah, it'd be sci-fi, I guess. Um, and the subtext was very good as well, you know, because it's relevant today, this obsession with celebrity culture and even by the celebrities themselves who are so, um, so, so weak that they need, they need, you know, to be adored forever. And so they'll go to the, they'll, they'll go to the extreme of fucking having their brains taken out and bunged in a synthetic body. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, the show is, the show is that shit's been alive ever since fucking Hollywood first started uh, breathing, you know. So yeah, that was pretty 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 good uh, tale. Uh, then the third one, the fucking Uterpy, the piano that kills people. Oh. Um, it, it wasn't much to that one, wasn't a great deal there. Uh, it wasn't scary, I mean. The creepiest thing about that was the portrait of the mother, who, um, the, the portrait was that of the woman who plays the uh, atropus in the framework story she makes a very brief appearance in all four of the stories in some sh shape way or form um but yeah that, that that picture looking that painting looking down on on, on like the room and that, that was probably the creepiest aspect um and yeah the whole piano pushing the woman out of the window at the end it was fucking comical really it's piano like mm, mm, mm. uh and she's like screaming like a bell end instead of just, you know, stepping to one side. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that was just a filler, really. That's the way that was. Um, so then the final story, uh, with Jack Plants and Peter Cushing, the uh, what's this one called? The Man Who Collected Poe. That's what that one's called. Um, I'd say overall is probably it's probably the best one. It's on a par with the first one with the cat. Uh, yeah, I thought Jack Palance and Peter Cushing were very good in that. I mean, Peter Cushing is, is very, uh, is very Peter Cushing in this, um, as the, uh, the, the collector of the Poe stuff. Um, Jack Palance is good because he plays the part throughout the story. He's, he's, he almost seems like he's having an anxiety attack, but he's, you know, he's so, uh, he's, he's so turned on by the work of Poe and that he's just like... <laughs> So excited by that, is uh, it always seems to be like hyperventilating nearly and a bit, a bit jittery. Um, so I thought that was a good, good uh, performance by Jack Palance. And um, I like the ending as well. You know the, the creepy secret room with fucking posts out there. It's like, hundred years ago I shut the bed. You don't really say that. It's just me being daft. Uh, anyway, um. The ending of the framework story, that was predictable. You, you could see that coming from a fucking mile off, really, you know. But overall, for Torture Garden, um, yeah. I mean, I love all the Amicus portmanteaus, anthologies. Um, not as good as Dr. Terror's House of Horrors. It's not as creepy as that. Uh, and the framework story's not got the uh, that claustrophobic uh, element that gives it such a, you know, creepy feel. You know, that adds such a gravitas to the uh, to the uh, the chill factor of it, the creepier factor. I mean, you know, doing it at a fair ground exhibit, that's, you know, that's 
that, that sort of kind of generic for a, a, a tale of this kind of story, a film of this type. Um, but it's cool because you know, you know the fairground, like places like fairground and circus. You imagine like, you know, what's behind it, what's in the tents. You know, what, what kind of creepy shit do they have? Okay. Um, so yeah, but yeah, the framework story was still very good at, at, in regards to the performance of Burgess Meredith and his character of Doctor Diablo. But yeah, so uh, to sum up in in, in total, uh, it's a you know it's a very ent it's an entertaining entry in and then very awesome entertaining series it's not as good as it's probably the weakest out of all of them maybe but it doesn't mean it's it's not good you know uh, nice nice uh, performances Burgess Meredith, Jack Plans, Peter Cushing, uh, Michael Bryant you know, well, you know all cast were decent um, in terms of atmosphere didn't quite have uh, that of the Doctor Terry's House of Horrors, but it still, it, but it, it, it did carry on the um, the uh, creepy atmosphere that the stories had in the first one with the first and the uh, fourth tales, and plus it did something a bit different with the second tale, but where it wasn't you know supernatural based and it was uh, kind of kind of s satirical almost, you know, um, you know satire about Hollywood celebrity. Uh, about vanity, I guess. Hollywood vanity. Okay, so that was uh, my thoughts on Torture Garden. My little review, retrospective, whatever you want to fucking call it. Uh, so yeah, if you've not seen Torture Garden, watch it. If you have seen it, you either agree with me or you don't. But I'm, I'm just cutting my teeth on camera, you know. I'm gonna, I'm, you know. I'm 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 laying seed. I'm laying seed. I'm sowing. I'm sowing the fucking seeds of cinema, and you know, with enough work, they will flower, and I will see you next time.